Okay, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the Rothbard lecturer. Um, I was sent a book last year, or maybe two years ago, maybe a year ago, um, by uh, Robert Higgs to um, review for the Independent Journal of Political Economy. Uh, and it had the great title, um, The Global Curse of the Federal Reserve. So of course I wanted to, uh, to uh, review it. But then I saw the subtitle. It said, um, uh, A Second Monetarist Revolution, I think the subtitle was. Um, but which was explained in the book in a way that made it more innocuous than it initially sounded to me. Um, <laughs> So the, the 2013 Murray N. Rothbard Memorial Lecture is sponsored by Helio Beltrow and will be presented by Dr. Brendan Brown. Dr. Brown is a widely followed market economist. He has authored many books on international financial topics, including monetary problems in the US, Europe, and Japan, and asset market pricing in a global context. His most recent book, which has just been published in its second edition, is the aptly titled The Global Curse of the Federal Reserve with a new subtitle. It's a wonderful read and I highly recommend it. Copies are available in our bookstore downstairs. Dr. Brown was awarded a PhD by the London School of Economics and an MBA by the University of Chicago. He is currently executive director and head of economic research at Mitsubishi Securities International. So I present to you Dr. Brown. Well, thank you very much for your kind introduction, Professor Salerno, and for inviting me here today. And um, your previous talk is an excellent introduction to what I have to say today, which really is how could a second monetarist revolution gain from the insights of the Austrian school and um, make up for the flaws of a first monetarist revolution, which I think we would all agree has failed by this point. Um, and I hope you don't find what I have to say heretical in any way, and uh, it's very much drawing on the Austrian tradition. Um, so the subject, the global curse of the Federal Reserve, first of all, what, what do I mean by the curse? And at first blush, you might think the curse is the fact that the dollar today, compared to what it was worth when the Federal Reserve opened its doors in 1913, is only about 3% of the real value. So the world has been um, deprived of um, what could have been an ideal um, global standard and global money, um, a hard US dollar. Um, but at second blush, what I'm, going to, I'm not dismissing that as a curse, but the curse which concerns me in this book um, is a second one, and that is the waves of irrational exuberance and depression, which um, the Fed has um, stimulated through its life. And these waves um, of irrational de depression and exuberance, or what uh, has some similarities to what Austrian economists call asset price inflation and asset price deflation, but they're not identical, um, has exerted or caused huge destruction economically and in some senses politically. There's two main forms of um, destruction that have come from these waves. One well known to Austrian school economists, which is malinvestment, and I don't have to spell out here. The second one it has actually been touched on in some of the earlier sessions today, and that is the form of destruction in the form of creating um, sick appetite for equity risk. Um, the fact that these waves, um, uh, which uh, create um, big booms and depressions, um, occur, first of all, um, mean that investors over time require higher risk rewards to go into investments of risk. And secondly, in looking at the future, they perceive more um, risk than we otherwise would have done if we, if we had a more stable background. So this ailing of equity risk appetite um, exerts a cost on economic welfare. I mean, if you consider two capitalist economies with the same endowments of labor and capital and natural resources, the one economy in which there's a healthy appetite for equity risk compared to the one in which there's a sick appetite for equity risk, the society in which there's a healthy appetite over the long run, not necessarily the short run, because mistakes can make, Columbus can go to America and discover the wrong continent, 
Um, but over the long run, you would expect for society which has the um, healthy appetite for equity risk to become the more prosperous. So I come next to what, what do I mean by waves of asset price inflation and asset price deflation or irrational exuberance and depression? I want to go one stage further back and quote J.S. Mill and um, Milton Friedman, um, of course, picked one um, phrase out of J.S. Mill and made it famous where um, Mill said that um, most of the time the machinery of money doesn't matter but when that machine, when the money machine gets out of control, then it throws a spanner into all the other machinery in the economy and causes them to go out of control also. I think in, I think in modern idiom, you would probably translate that or rephrase it as saying most of the time, the software of money is unimportant, but if the software of money becomes um, corrupt, it infects all the other software um, which controls the prices in the economy and direct for market signals for the invisible forces. It, in, in, it infects those and causes them to go out of control and give the wrong price signals, especially in the capital markets, which leads to a lot of um, economic pain and, and mis misallocation and non-optimal outcomes. Um, again, going back to Milton Friedman, um, when he when he interprets this line from J.S. Mill, um, as um, Professor Salerno said, I would guess that he very much meant um, goods and services inflation. Um, what I try to add in my book to this is the second form of virus attack, which comes from money getting out of control or being corrupted, and that's asset price inflation. So there's two diseases, two monetary viruses. They may be linked. They may both appear in the same cycle, and they may not. Um, one, one is the disease of asset price inflation. The other is the disease of um, goods and services inflation. Now, um, the, uh, when, I, when I talk about asset price inflation, I th earlier on I did talk about irrational exuberance and depression, and, and, and I'm sure you're all aware of behavioral finance literature where these terms are used quite freely, and by Professor Schiller in particular. I don't have any problem with, in fact, I, I enjoy reading Professor Schiller's work very much in behavioral finance theorists, but what I'm constantly taken back by is that their analysis of how these um, irrational exuberance comes about, they completely miss out any monetary factor. And I would argue, or try to argue, that the main factor behind these waves of irrational exuberance, which Robert Schiller talks about, is in fact monetary disequilibrium. Um, and to, de to describe what, um, what we mean by irrational exuberance or asset price inflation, it's a bit different from the Austrian concept you're all aware of here of, of whether it's capital goods prices getting out of line with consumer goods prices. What I'm talking about here is more in, in terms of asset price inflation, um, irrational exuberance, and I could describe this in two ways, one simplistic, one a bit more complicated. The simplistic way of describing asset price inflation is where investors are putting on some rose-colored spectacles which filter out the dangers and exaggerate the size of expected returns. If I was putting this more in terms of a sort of arrow state preference theory, I would say that um, irrational exuberance is where investors systematically are, tr are putting too much probability on the states of a world with good outcomes and too little probability on states of a world with bad un outcomes. Um, Friedman refers to the long lags between monetary disequilibrium and the monetary virus appearing in a form which can be diagnosed um, in the form of goods and services inflation, but that lag is indeed even more serious when we come to the second monetary virus. I argue that by the time anyone can confidently say that the, mon the monetary virus of um, asset price inflation is there and demonstrate it in a positive way, which would be accepted um, un unambiguously, the disease is probably long present and um, already had a very serious negative effect on the economy. And by the time central banks or anyone else can make a definitive positive test to demonstrate that asset price inflation is present, it's probably well on the way to turning itself into asset price deflation. 
because asset price inflation, unlike goods and services inflation, does tend to mutate back into deflation without any action being taken. And the reason why asset price inflation tends to go reverse itself is because of the um, features which are so well known to Austrian economists, that you, get, you tend to get overinvestment, profit margins come down, or if people are wearing rose-colored spectacles and ignoring risks, when any of these risks do occur, they have a much more profound effect in shaking market prices back down to a very low level, and that exerts a shock effect on the economy. Um, and, um, you know, the idea which we have so much in modern Federal Reserve thinking that a team of regulators or anyone else can um, somehow judge when asset price inflation is there and do something about it, I think is just totally pie in the sky. Um, and the history is full of um, examples of, of where asset price inflation, by the time the central bank recognizes it's there, um, they only make matters worse. I'll quote you a few examples. 1929 is one obvious example. By the time the Federal Reserve in 1928 is confident about there being asset price inflation, it's already been there a long time. Florida boom already moved into bust 18 months before the real estate cycle in, in the United States was already peaking in early or mid-1928. Um, so by tightening policy, by the time they recognized asset price inflation, it was already bound to move on to asset price deflation and they only made the consequent recession worse. You can quote the same example in Japan in the late 1980s, where the Bank of Japan um, eventually starts tightening policy in 1988, well, not 1988, the end of 1989, early 1990, when already golf course prices were beginning to tumble and the early signs of asset price inflation going to deflation were there, and they end up turning it into a, a, a serious recession. And I would argue the same thing actually happened under Bernanke in 2007, 2008, and that I think was a strong case to say that the oil price um, going up to $150 in the summer of 2008 was actually the last dying feature of asset price inflation, which had already generally died in a whole lot of other markets. And by acting against oil prices at that level was just a classic case of um, panicking uh, central banks responding to asset price inflation when it was already dying and making the subsequent recession even worse. Now, I want to, um, at this point, just look at um, three from three channels which I suggest run from monetary disequilibrium to these waves of irrational exuberance. What, what's, how does monetary disequilibrium create waves of irrational exuberance? And I suggest three main forms. Now, some of these may involve a degree of irrationality, some of them may not. The first, the first um, channel is, um, and I, th I think in many ways, the most robust against, challenge, against challenges that you're assuming a lot of irrationality, is um, pegging and forward guidance of short-term rates. Um, modern central banks and, and the Federal Reserve, by pegging short-term rates and announcing or implying where short-term rates are going to be going in the future, um, have a very big effect on long-term interest rates. That's quite different, as I mentioned this morning, from the situation under the gold standard where short-term rates pretty well oscillated around violently and long-term interest rates had a life of their own and were very much influenced by the sort of um, decentralized information um, effects which Austrian economists would applaud. Um, that all, that's all broken under the sort of pegging of forward of short-term interest rates which reached a... Um, which, which became more and more, um, or, or at certain times in the Federal Reserve history in the last 100 years, has become very, very substantial. Now, when you have, when the result of this is to bring long-term interest rates below neutral um, and or below equilibrium level, you get into an area of what um, Schiller describes as positive feedback loops. Um, the fact that there's a lot of froth in asset prices because the long-term rates are below neutral, um, in turn, tend to validate, validate a speculative hypothesis which is out there. You know, I could borrow from Minsky, for example, the idea, or Professor Alaba at University of Chicago, the idea that at various times in markets, there, is, there are speculative stories in, in some, some, I mean, I can give you examples in the late 19, mid 1920s, there was a speculative hypothesis that Germany in the Weimar Republic was in a miracle economy. 
Um, we had the um, speculative hypothesis in the, 19, in the 2000s that European Monetary Union was a miracle in which financial uh, ba banks were going to have a huge new profit opportunity from this integrated European market. Now, in, in normal, rational mood, these sort of speculative stories, nobody would probably give more than 20 or 30% probability to them being true. But when you have the central bank holding interest rates down and long-term interest rates getting below neutral, then those speculative stories tend to get an inflated life of our own through the, through, through the feedbacks um, uh, of the positive feedback loops. So that's one, that's, one, um, that's one channel of monetary virus attack leading to asset price inflation. The other, the other two channels um, in, involve desperation at low real yields if interest rates are being held by the central bank at very low levels in real terms, even if in line with neutral. Um, if investors have had no experience in the past to make up for that of price level falls, as they normally would do in a monetary stable world where you had periods of price falls and price rises, but all they can look forward to is price rises and, and, and income famine. Out of desperation, they look for um, speculative stories to derive real yields. And the third, the third monetary channel is what I describe as inflation scare. If central bank policy today isn't actually creating inflation, but there's a danger that there may be high inflation several years in the future, then investors again may respond in somewhat irrational way to seek out real yield. Um, now, I, I would stress one other point, that asset price inflation isn't affecting all markets at all times. There, have to, there has to be a speculative story. So, um, you know, going fast forward to the present, um, under the Bernanke um, QE policies after 2007, you know, the, the first speculative stories that emerge are those related to China, because you have the coincidence of the QE policy starting off at the same time as China itself is having a massive, massive monetary expansion. So the, spe the speculative stories which catch on are those related to commodity prices, emerging markets, Brazil, all the countries doing well out of the China phenomenon. Um, that in turn may fade, and then the speculative story moves on to somewhere else. So you do, get, you do tend to get these rotations of asset price inflation rather than all markets being affected at all times during this phase. Now, I want to, I want to review those ideas um, somewhat more in terms of the 100-year monetary disorder we've had under the Federal Reserve um, since 1913. Um, asset price inflation, um, to be accurate, did not originate with the Federal Reserve. And I must stress, maybe at a point, at this point, um, you know, many of you may be saying, given the sort of views I'm expressing here, why are we talking about monetarism coming back or anything else? But I'm, I'm putting this in the context of, um, yes, the international gold stand before 1914 may be the best, although imperfect, order that the world's come up with. But once the world comes out of that um, semi-golden garden of Eden, the cost of going back in again may be so exorbitant that it's impossible ever to get back in. And of course, one can argue about that, but I suppose that's the sort of background hypothesis to some of what I'm writing about. But so, so the point I would stress here is that asset price inflation didn't originate with the Federal Reserve, but the size of the waves and their frequency has got much larger under that institution's 100-year monetary history. And um, if you go back to the gold standard days, there, was a, there were some large booms and busts. I mean, most, most um, particularly, there was that of 1907. Of course, you can trace the boom and bust of 1907 and the asset price inflation of the 1905-1906 period to the fact that you had a very rapid growth of gold, gold stock in those years related to the new technology of mining gold. So that was a form of... Um, disequilibrium growth of the monetary base, which was feeding this asset price inflation process. But in broad, in broad terms, through the gold standard world, um, the, the gold standard world was a monetary system which had important checks and balances against the progress of asset price inflation. Um, I think one can essentially look at the gold standard world, the pre-Federal Reserve system, as a monetary-based control system. It was a monetary-based control system where the fixed price of gold regulated the supply of monetary base aggregated across all countries which were on the gold standard. There was free determination of interest rates. Price level fluctuated considerably 
up and down for a purpose. And when I say for a purpose, you know, many people lose sight of the fact that one of the equilibrating mechanisms under the gold standard, to, or which guided the invisible hands towards creating business cycle recoveries, was the perpetual expectation of prices going back to a constant level. So if prices fell during the recession, there was the expectation that prices would go back up again in the subsequent recovery. And so combination of low prices now with high prices in the future meant that, in fact, you got the negative real interest rates, which Bernanke so desperately tries to create today through hyped-up inflation expectations. So, um, and the, the, the white noise that you got in the short-term interest rate markets through um, um, go, temporary gold shortages helped insulate the long-term bond markets from getting infected through any manipulation going on in short-term interest rate markets. So all of, this, all of this helped restrain asset price inflation waves from coming about, although nonetheless they did sometimes come about. But I would argue, and this is an empirical assertion, I guess, that the waves will have been much more violent since the Federal Reserve opened its doors. Um, no sooner, of course, did the Fed open its doors in 1913 when the gold, gold standard disintegrated. Um, somewhat paradoxically, if you look at the history of the Federal Reserve during the First World War, um, Brian, who had been, I think, one of the leading opponents of gold in the US, immediately advocated in 1914 during a crisis that the Federal Reserve or the US should leave the gold standard. Um, whilst um, people like Benjamin Strong and Warburg, who were in the Federal Reserve, were very much of the opinion that the dollar should be, still be backed by gold and it was very dangerous to go over to fiat money. One of, in one of the paradoxes of monetary history, of course, if, if the US had followed Brian and de, de, uh, had taken the dollar temporarily off gold, there probably wouldn't have been the high inflation and asset price inflation that actually occurred from 1914 to 1917 because these gold inflows, essentially the entente pars, dumped their gold in the U.S. and basically levied an inflation tax in the U.S. through creating inflation to pay for the war. Um, so if instead they'd followed the example of Switzerland in Europe at the time, which actually in similar circumstances of neutrality broke the link of their franc with, with gold and had much less inflation than the United States. But I don't want to get way laid into that. It's a fascinating description for any of you who want to look as to what, how the Fed operated during the First World War and in some, in, in some degree affected the possibility of peace being reached in 1916 or not. But I want to go fast forward to the 1921 to 1929 period. Um, and we sort of covered this this morning, um, where Friedman and Schwartz described that as the high tide of the Federal Reserve. Um, it's a, it's a very important historical episode because it's critical, I think, in examining that period um, to draw out the lessons for monetarism which weren't drawn out by the first generation of, of monetarists um, because quite evidently, as the Austrian school make, um, and, uh, make very clear and Rothbard in particular, the, um, the, it was the fixing of... Um, and, or manipulation of interest rates and the too rapid growth of monetary base during that period, um, which contributed um, to the wave of a huge wave of irrational exuberance. And of course, the biggest asset price inflation of all was arguably in the German credit market, um, from because from 1924 onwards, Germany was part of the. Um, a, a dollar area having fixed the Reich mark of a dollar in 1924 and with interest rates well below equilibrium levels in the United States um, US investors were very um, keen to get a higher yield which they did in Germany and um, the speculative hypothesis which went along with that was the Weimar Republic and the economic miracle which was taking place if you look at real estate prices in Berlin going up by a factor of five or six during just five years from 1924 to 20, 1929, it's fairly evident what all, all this, uh, where, 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 where this was um, leading. And then inevitably, um, the asset price inflation turns to asset price deflation and, and the second largest economy in, on, on the earth, Germany at that time, goes into default and, and that creates a feedback and that so intensifies the Great Depression in 1931. Um, my next example of asset price inflation is actually in some ways closer to the situation we have today. 
although I would stress, and I, later on, if I have a chance, I'll go into a bit more, there were some dissim dissimilarities. Um, this is in the period 1935 to 1937. Um, 1935 to 1936, if you look at it, the monetary base in the US went up in pretty similar fashion to what it's done under Ben Bernanke in the last two or three years. But of course, it wasn't an explicit policy action. It was in response to gold inflows coming in and being monetized. Um, but, but this um, period of exceptionally low interest rates together with the big rise in prices and concern about um, um, inflation ahead um, did drive a process of asset price inflation. Stock markets doubled in about 18 months from 30, late 1935 to the end of 1936. Investors put on their rose-colored spectacles. They ignored the fact that... Um, that um, geopolitical skies were darkening. And that's an, actually one interesting point in Lionel Robbins' book that um, he mentions already that in um, mid-1930s, um, many firms were holding back on investment because they were concerned about the risk of World War, something which Keynesians completely miss out when they des describe World War II as the savior of the US economy. It was quite the other way around. Um, but... Um, and they were, they were, the investors were also ignoring um, the fact that the gold block broke up in Europe in 1936, um, meaning that the dollar was suddenly shooting up again and the devaluation had come to an end. But by the time we get into early 1937 and the Supreme Court rules in favor of the Wagner Act and Roosevelt's won his landslide victory at the end of 36, eventually reality catches up, the, the spectacle, the rose-colored spectacles break. And in about four months from spring 1937, you get a 40% fall in the stock market in the Roosevelt recession, which is even more severe than that of 1929 to 1930. So that's an example of uh, which bears some similarities to present situation. Now, um, I'm going fast forward here. I'm not going to spend much time on the World War II situation, but um, I think it's possible to look at the um, Martin period of the Federal Reserve, um, Martin becoming Fed chairman in, I think, 1952 or somewhere there around. Um, and um, this was a period of, just before I do that, I'll, I'll just make one comment. You know, many people say, um, or, or the point's been put forward now, how, how is the Fed going to extricate itself from this extraordinary monetary policy that's been followed, and how can it decontrol the bond market um, after this long period of manipulation? And some optimistic commentators say, well, look, the Fed managed to, and the government decontrolled long-term interest rates in 1953, and yet there wasn't any great calamity. But of course, what you had in 1953 onwards was um, an, an economic boom, an economic miracle with Germany growing 10% per annum, Japan growing 10% per annum, and a huge productivity um, growth spurt in the, in the United States. And you would think that given this, given this growth spurt everywhere and productivity miracle, um, on any Austrian view of monetary stability, of course, the price level should have been falling in the United States through, through the um, 19, late 1950s and early 1960s, instead of which it was rising at around 2% and briefly somewhat lower. And to give credit where credit's due, actually, if you go back in that literature, and I'm not sure whether it's on the Von Mises Institute website or not, Arthur Burns did write a book in the late 1950s attacking the Fed for um, uh, pursuing an inflationary policy and saying the price level should be stable. Um, but of course, the corollary of that, um, the Fed under Martin pursuing um, uh, the inflation in the middle of a once in a century economic miracle um, was asset price inflation. This was a period of, um, this was a period of uh, Buffett making his fortune, the real estate titans making their fortune. It was the period of um, the, the huge equity market speculation, equity markets tripling. And um, as you would expect, this at asset price inflation um, merged, moved on to asset price deflation in 1969 with the fantastic fall in the market which, um, and in real estate markets, which then Arthur Burns was called in by Nixon to try to reverse, which he did for a few years, but then ended up with an even bigger crash in 1973. Um, you then, you then go further forward um, with that history um, to currency war machine being um, very much 
part of the Federal Reserve apparatus. Once you have a floating exchange rate, um, currency war machine um, becomes very much a feature. And um, I would highlight the example, which maybe is very often glossed over or maybe not recognized, that one of the biggest currency warriors was none other than Paul Volcker. You know, Paul Volcker started as Treasury under its secretary in the Nixon um, administration, um, going around all the capitals in Europe, arguing and, and implementing big dollar devaluation, um, which leads on to the inflation of the 1970s. Then he comes in in 1980-81, runs basically two-year so-called monetarist policy, and um, then abandons it. And of course, the... Um, pressures by the mid-1980s, 1985, were huge on trade protection. And um, essentially, um, Volcker goes along with the idea that the dollar has to be devalued and there's, there's a trade and currency war against Japan and Germany. But in doing that, of course, the Fed had to do its bit in implementing the currency war machine of keeping interest rates way below neutral, um, which is what happens. And you get the great asset price inflation in the United States in the late 1980s. The, real, the, the equity market bubble and bust of 1987, real estate markets. And of course, all of this rolls on to Japan. Um, and as a separate note on Japan, I would say, if you look at the 40-year history of Japan since 1970, um, Japan has essentially had to deal in very difficult circumstances with the Federal Reserve curse. You know, and, the, and each time they, each time they, uh, each time they respond to the curse by deciding the best way to bring the yen down is to copy what the Fed's doing. But by copying what the Fed's doing, we end up with an even bigger economic um, calamity in our own country. So, in the early 1970s, the Bank of Japan follows the, the uh, reluctantly the um, the Nixon, Nixon and Burns Fed into inflationary policies and end up with 30% inflation in Japan by the mid 1970s. They follow Volcker into lower interest rates in the late 1980s and end up with a gigantic credit bubble. And then, of course, um, in the early 2000s with the, um, with the Clinton war, not, not the, sorry, the Bush um, currency war, uh, uh, they end up bringing interest rates down to zero and monetary base expansion, and they end up with a gigantic yen carry trade um, bubble, which leads to an overextension of our export sector malinvestment, and it all comes apart in 2007-2008. Um, so in the time I have left, I want to maybe stop for history and come on to two big questions. How to cure the curse and um, what to, is it going to be cured? Is there any prospect that it really is going to be cured? And um, I suggest for six, step, six steps towards curing the curse. One, inflation targeting has to be dropped altogether in, fav in favor of a general aim of price level stability over the very long run, such as, one had, such as one had under the gold standard. Secondly, no more deflation phobia. Um, monetary rules, insofar as they are adopted as part of the second monetarist revolution, must be designed so as to mean a fall in prices during bouts of productivity growth, such as one had in the 1920s or 1950s or, or in the 1990s for that matter. Third, we have to stop all manipulation of long-term interest rates, and the Bernankeite bond market manipulator has to be smashed up. Fourth, restore monetary base to the pivot of a monetary system. Now, restoring monetary base to the pivot of a monetary system means um, abandoning paying interest rate, any interest on reserves, and getting back to a fairly high level of reserve requirements, because if you have a trivially low level of reserve requirements, then having a stable X percent rule for monetary base expansion doesn't really give, give you any assurance of overall monetary stability. Um, fifth, um, eliminate Orwellian monetary history, especially the chapters in the Great Depression and Japan's Great Deflation, which never existed. I mean, if you look at Japan's deflation, so-called um, price level in 2010, or two, sorry, 2012 in Japan is pretty well the same as what it was in 19... 92 on some measures, and if you look at the hedonic price adjusted series, it may be down 10 or 13 percent, but if you'd had a hedonic price adjustment during the gold standard years, the price level would have been falling all the time. So Japan hasn't had any great deflation. Its problems lie elsewhere, which is beyond today's talk. But um, sixth, sixth step, um, and the key step in how to cure the curse is to acknowledge asset price inflation as a deadly virus of the economy which can only be spread by monetary disorder. The only way you get 
to large asset price inflations is by monetary disorder. And the best way of preventing these waves of, of irrational exuberance and depression getting very large, you can't eliminate them altogether, is to stick rigorously to a monetary stability order. You can't, uh, having teams of regulators thinking they can spot it in advance is just completely futile. Um, and um, lastly, um, I come to when, when will the cure come? Well, I think a key point here is the cure is not going to come from within the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve now is a more than possibly any time in its 100-year life packed by political appointees who are all there uh, or ignoring one or two members who already don't have any power. Um, so if there's going to be any monetary reform, it has to be led by political forces which regain um, ascendancy um, in the wider scene and are then able to reform or abolish or whatever the Federal Reserve. Um, second point is... The second monetarist revolutionaries have to learn what went wrong with the first monetarist revolution. Um, and I would suggest that, um, unfortunately, um, as Professor Salerno started to outline, some of these roots misleadingly, some of these roots do go back to Milton Friedman's teachings. Um, Bernankeism has to be um, obliterated. You know, the three, the, three, the, three, the three features of Bernankeism, currency war machine, bond manipulation machine, and virtual monetary helicopters, they have to go. And, and, and when, I, when I'm talking about virtual monetary helicopters, that's actually quite an important point because today's monetary base expansion by the Fed is not real monetary base expansion. What we have today is the Fed is essentially, the government, U.S. government is essentially issuing two forms, it's financing itself by issuing two forms of treasury bills. One is the B treasury bill for Bernanke, which is issued at a, a gift bonus rate for the big, big banks to buy. And there's another category of, of treasury bill, the ordinary treasury bill, which is just for you and me, which is issued at zero. So of course, the banks are going in to buy the B treasury bills at 25 basis points and issue deposits to zero to everybody else. That's fan, fantastic arbitrage. So the, so the government's basically funding itself by issuing these B treasury bills. And the rest is just, is just funny bookkeeping, the fact that the Fed may be buying long-term bonds and issuing B treasury bills, who really cares? The, gov the government is financing itself with floating rate treasury bills, but in the process giving a bonus to the banks. That's, that's, that could all be unwound tomorrow if, if B treasury bills came to an end and the interest rate paid on B treasury bills was the same as for everybody else. You would get massive disintermediation from the banks. Um, it probably wouldn't affect the outlook for credit or anything else very much, although it might have some psychological effect because the, the second component of Bernankeism, which is the bond market manipulator, does depend on a whole lot of psychological effects included amongst those is a lot of investors believing that there is a lot of money printing going on. Um, the, um, and this brings me to a last point, um, talking about second monetarist revolution. Um, I think it was Napoleon who said that the biggest, the, the main quality he looked for when he chose generals or field marshals was luck. It's much, it's much better to have a lucky, lucky general than an than a excellent general. So clearly, um, you know, whether there's ever a prospect of a second monetarist revolution taking place depends on luck. And, and I mean by luck, does the scenario of 1937, which is a very likely scenario for how this is all going to end up, happen before or after an election? Um, and then you have to ask, you know, even if it happens before an election, is, is the way when the next crisis happens in the next depression or recession, is it going to lead on to a monetarist revolution or is it going to lead on to RB economics and the road to socialism? And I'm not going to answer that question because I have to, I have to remain optimistic. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>